RDM has um, many years now of experience with running different projects. Um, this particular low speed autonomous vehicle project um, is actually in the second generation now. With um, We did the previous project uh, along with some other partners, uh, first generation of these vehicles. We find that working in a collaboration with other companies, universities, and other stakeholders within the whole field really helps to bring the system to a suitable level. Engaging early with all the key stakeholders, setting firm requirements, engineering a system such that it meets people's expectations as well as the technical issues of the, of the problem. And then when you've implemented something, then bringing those same people back in the loop to validate it. So it's very easy to uh, to think you know how you're going to feel when you ride in an autonomous vehicle, but there's nothing like getting people in an autonomous vehicle and having them experience it. So working together with um, other partners, especially people, for instance, Warwick University is one of our partners. We have people in Milton Keynes and Milton Keynes Council and Coventry City Council. Uh, we bring all those stakeholders together and basically we listen to what people's concerns are. And they're not necessarily the concerns that you'd normally think of as an engineer. So it's really good to, um, to have an avenue for people to be able to influence the final product, the final solution, uh, and how the system's operated. To try to address some of the aspects of different stakeholder um, feelings and the different use cases, um, it's really good to have a structured and repeatable framework in which you can allow people to experience the technology. So one thing we've done working together uh, with the Warwick Manufacturing Group is to set up uh, an experiential engineering department. So in that case, it's a, uh, an indoor test facility where we can run these vehicles around in private. We can run them 24 hours a day. Uh, we bring people in from different user groups, uh, we give them questionnaires, we take them on a trip in a pod. We can also uh, make it so their trip isn't just a regular trip, but we can add events into that trip. For instance, someone walking out in front of you unexpectedly. We can choreograph effectively scenarios so we have repeatable data from one use case to another. Uh, and then we ask the people afterwards. We give them a questionnaire again at the end and say, you know, how is your perception now different? Was it enjoyable? Uh, do you have a trust in the autonomy or not? Depending on the, the trip that they've taken. And by doing that kind of work with many, many candidates, you then have evidence as to whether you're really going in the right direction, whether you're perceiving people's wants and needs correctly. So we do occasionally come over specific barriers when we're running these kinds of experiments and trying to engage with different parties. It's always difficult to know that the demographic of the people that you've got is a representative dem demographic. Typically, the people that would not want to engage with the technology are the people that would not want to come to a clinic and experience the technology. So obviously, you can potentially exclude valuable parties in that way. Also, you can go the other way and have a lot of advocates turn up at the door wanting a trip because they want to have the experience and they're not necessarily part of the group that you need to have that evidence from because you have plenty of people that will already volunteer for that. And similarly, when you've taken people on one of these trips and you collect all the information and data, uh, it's then knowing what you can do with that data, how you can interpret that data in a sensible way that doesn't lead you to believe that you're addressing the problem that isn't really the root of people's feelings or their experience or what they're expecting from such a system. As part of our user group, we've intentionally made outreach to various different user groups. So um, we've pulled in some people, for instance, we have a, a, a cooperation with the Guide Dogs for the Blind Association who have got some excellent uh, knowledge and experience with public transport analysis and very detailed, even technical analysis of public transport. Um, very, very knowledgeable people uh, and, and also great advocates for 
public transport systems that are inclusive for people with all different levels of mobility. We also have other uh, user groups uh, that we've brought in. The vehicle has been designed so it's wheelchair accessible, uh, specifically to address people with other mobility needs. We also have uh, some users that, um, that we've come with um, uh, young kids that you also need to, you know, the, the family situation, young kids, uh, and then the older generation as well, uh, specifically for things like uh, hail and ride, where you're expecting people to use smartphones. Obviously, if you've only got a landline and smartphones are something of, uh, of, a, of a novelty, then you don't want to exclude those older people from your, uh, from your experiments. So doing manual ticketing, for instance, we have marshals, real people on the ground you can talk to, explain the technology as people use it, help people in and out, uh, and also make, a, um, yeah, make an assessment on whether those people um, are happy with their role in that experiment, rather than just relying on the person to make a decision that they're happy with their role in that experiment. Because quite a lot of people seem to be maybe a little more enthusiastic than they really are. They put on some kind of front because they don't want to lose face. So you don't want to bring people like that into an experiment where they feel at all threatened. So having some empathy for the people who you're using in your experiments is also extremely important. So working with the other partners in the Prisma project has been really interesting for us. Again, as a small family business, we don't have formal education in ethics. We don't have formal education in responsible innovation. And um, it's been really interesting to have some experts in the field do some case studies on us because we can learn what we're doing well and we can learn where things can be improved. And we also get a bit of a feeling of benchmarking ourselves against the rest of the innovation world out there uh, to have a feeling as, yeah, just how well are we performing? Are we... Are we world class? We like to be world class at everything, but it's really hard to know that without spending lots of money with consultancies to do that kind of work. So it's really refreshing to meet other experts in the field, but also other companies that have volunteered themselves up for these kinds of Prisma analysis, meeting those other people and understanding some of their concerns and some of the concerns are our concerns. They're the same things, slight differences, but quite a lot of it boils down to the same part. A lot of it is about how do I interface with my customers, understand their values, take care of their data, take care of their privacy, and be inclusive. As a small family owned business, it's somewhat easier for us to set our own path as where our responsible innovation goes. Every person that works in our company is close enough to the end users and the products that they see exactly where their contribution ends and how it can affect someone out there in the field or some other party that's a stakeholder. Whereas if you have much bigger corporations, you can often get lost in the corporate mire, shall we say, of being so far away from any product or any deliverable that you don't think the work that you're doing will ever end up affecting anybody. Um, and then you can be very blasé because you don't have an interface with a stakeholder and um, you can even do things totally unintentionally that end up with the consequence that means you're not being ethical. It's easier, shall we say, from my perspective, being a smaller company. But if you turn yourself in a big company in a departmental role and look at yourselves as individual actors, there's no reason why you can't hunt out who is your stakeholder and make sure that you're listening and that you're looking at a broader picture. So as part of the business model to make these vehicles and the system run as a transport solution, obviously we need a lot of data. So to be able to roll the system out, you've got to know it's safe. The only way to know it's safe is by having enough evidence that your system performs correctly under all circumstances, which means you have to be able to record all circumstances. So we record high fidelity data of every single trip and we store all that data so that we can look back on it, we can get deep learning from it, we can analyze it and put it into categories that then we can use to repeatedly play to our system to ensure that it can perform under all cases. So all data is useful, 
all data has value. On the other hand, users are experiencing this system and they are part of our data set. So we have to be very careful that the data we collect on people is made anonymous. It's only kept where it's needed for the purposes that the user has granted us and that the data is kept secure and under control in the limited uh, circulation. And then as a business, we need to know that the vehicles are actually performing the task and the solution that is going to give you a business case in the end. So in the end, the vehicle has to earn its keep. In the end, your trip is paid for by somebody. In our business model, the trip would finally be paid for the people who own the establishment where we're taking you to in one particular business model. So if you're going from the train station to the shopping center, whichever shop we take you to in the shopping center may pay for your trip. Uh, if you buy something at that store, maybe they'll pay for your trip to get back to the rail station. We can also do um, marketing related um, co-joined advertising, if you like. We can also do trips and destinations based on other people's favorites. So if lots of people want to buy a pair of jeans and you're typing our, our destination planner, please take me somewhere I can buy a pair of jeans, it may well say, oh, other people that bought a pair of jeans, they went to this particular store. However, I can give you 10% off at this other store if you'd like to go there instead. So there are all sorts of ways that down the road, the system will have to trade the operation objectives against the business case. And that's another reason for having experts in the field. And another part of the learning we've had with the Prisma project is how you can decide what is a sensible level of remuneration, what is a sensible level of trading other people's opinion or data against an end solution. So that it's a benefit for the customer and they see a value in it, but you're not compromising their integrity or their data.